This did happen to me. It was I was in junior high school, 135 in the Bronx. I even know the year. Uh, it, it was uh, the, uh, the fall of 1958, and I was in seventh grade. And I remember the name of the librarian, a Mrs. Dason. I get a note that she wants to see me in the library. So I go down to see her and she invites me to sit uh, you know, in front of her desk and she has this really serious, almost grim face. And she says to me, do you have any idea why I called you down here? I said, honestly, no. I, and then she gives me like a you know, piece of paper and I look at the paper and I see it's a list of all the books I had taken out of the library. And she says to me, do you now see what the problem is? And at that point, I, the only problem I could see is that every single book had been a science fiction novel. And, uh, but I figured I'd let her tell me. So I said, no. And that's when she said to me, pretty much what Phil just said, she said, look, you know, if all you do is eat one thing, you'll get physically ill. If all you do is read one thing, you'll get mentally ill. And I remember thinking, I'm already there. It's like too late for me, uh, you know, if that's you know, what the problem that she's trying to avoid is. And she actually went so far as to say, I, I'm not going to let you take any more books out of the library until you broaden your horizons. You know, you need to read other things. So uh, what I did is I did not go back to the library. And instead, I w went to the local branch of the New York Public Library, the Out Avenue branch. They had every Isaac Asimov novel, every Robert Heinlein novel, every you know Arthur C. Clarke novel. I mean, it was just fabulous, and and well, and those old collections of short stories. And uh, yeah, you know, I you know I figured I can leave it to the world to decide whether Mrs. Dayton was was right or wrong uh, that made me mentally ill. If I am, she might I have been right, but we're not allowed to do that anymore. We have to let people read what they want, whether or not we approve. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. It's a step of, I mean, nowadays, my guess is librarians are probably happy if kids even read pornography as long as they're reading something, right? I mean, actually, well, we're not quite that liberal. Like, as about Fifty Shades of Grey is as pornographic as we get these days. But uh, yeah, when I don't I... care who reads what. When I was in seventh grade, I kept trying to read books that were way above my my grade level. Like I kept trying to pull um, like Kurt Vonnegut off my father's shelf. I was trying to read like, you know, uh, The Scarlet Letter and, you know, Silas Marner or whatever. And at a certain point, my dad saw me on a beach trying to read Silas Marner and said, Claire, can't you take up Harlequins or something? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Well, yeah, look, Silas Marner uh, is, is a uh, tough book to read for sure. Uh, yeah. You know, the things they give kids to read. I mean, I remember telling my own son years later, don't read Jude the Obscure if you are already sad or in a bad mood about something, because that's like one of the most depressing <laughs> books, you know, ever written. Uh, in contrast to most science fiction, which at least, you know, the, the protagonist has a fighting chance uh, of solving the problem. I think when I was young, I was most shocked because I was trying to read through all the classics and I read Tom Jones. Oh my goodness, this is a classic. This is so racy. Someone's having sex every chapter. <laughs> I'm like, good books really are good, aren't they? <laughs> Yeah, well, I had the experience, uh, you know, our daughter Molly is now 34 and she actually runs a, uh, a pre-K uh, school in, in Manhattan. But uh, as at least Phil knows, my first novel, uh, which was published in 1999, uh, is The Silk Code. And before I even sent it in to the late David Hartwell, I, I had printed out, you know, the manuscript and I had left it on a table in our living room, only to find uh, the next day our daughter Molly, then 12 years old, was like delightedly reading the novel. And actually she gave me a great review, better than I've ever gotten. She said, Daddy, this is the best book I've ever read. So I, mean, that, I was happy to get that. Uh, but then I realized that there are some, you know, somewhat to very racy scenes in the novel. So I mean, she was 12 years old, uh, but, um, 
you know, you do have to be careful in terms of uh, you know, what people pick up and read, for sure. By the way, I apologize uh, for stealing your thunder on that story, Paul, but it does show that I pay attention when our guest speakers talk. Even if I've got an imperfect memory, I remember the gist of it like 15, 20 years later. Yeah, well, I'm very happy. Look, Mrs. Dason, you know, God bless her. I have no idea where she is today and, you know, how she's doing. But uh, I dedicated one of my novels to her. Anytime the subject of science fiction and librarians come up, I, I can't help but relate that, that same story. So we've got a couple of people who are not here yet. Uh, but my suggestion is that we get started. I'll make an introduction and then turn it over to you. And uh, then you can take it from there. And uh, so, okay, I thank everyone who's shown up and hopefully the people who are yet to show up, but I won't hear this lovely sparkling introduction. Uh, thank you for making it tonight. This is the Films From Beyond Film Discussion Group of the Science Fiction Association of Bergen County. We hold it on the second Thursday of the month and we've been doing this for around a year. Uh, we also have a movie watching group and we also have a monthly general meeting which features uh, experts in the science fiction field giving talks and other presentations. Uh, Paul Levinson is one of these fine past stars. Uh, we just had uh, Duke University evolutionary biologist slash Star Trek consultant Mohammed Noor speaking on Saturday. And the next month we have science fiction writer and aerospace engineer Will McCarthy speaking. Uh, we also have a movie watching group, as I said, yet last night we watched the indie film adaptation of Neil Gaiman's uh, How to Talk to Girls at Parties. And next month we're going to be showing Brown Girl Begins, which is an indie film prequel to the Nalo Hopkinson novel. So tonight we are really uh, excited to have Paul Levinson. Uh, to Paul is a, a science fiction writer, uh, university professor, uh, commentator on popular culture, has been interviewed uh, radio, TV, print, and so on. Uh, he's also a past president of the Science Fiction Writers of America, as well as being the author of a number of science fiction novels. Uh, also, I'm going to just let everyone know that as this is an odd two things. First of all, Paul is recording this event so that if anyone is camera shy and wants to put a piece of paper over the over the camera so that they can't be seen, uh, or if you have any problems, I just I always feel people should be made aware of this. But Paul does know people who wanted to make it and couldn't. Because as I said. This is a monthly pre uh, series that we do, and next, and we're, we're doing is we're alternating between looking at a, a decade's worth of movies and also looking at and discussing short films. So next month, we will be looking at some short films, which people can volunteer from the audience, give us a link, and we'll play and watch it through the share screen function. And after that, this month is effectively the 1920s, next month, we'll be doing the uh, genre of the 1930s. Paul, if you want to come back, either to lead us or just to be in the audience, you're welcome to, but I don't want to put you on the spot. You don't have to do that. The month after that, we'll do short films. The month after that, the 40s and so on. So take it away, Paul Levinson, with a drum roll. Brrrm. Well, thank you. That was a great introduction, Phil. I could sit and listen to that all night. It was, it was so enjoyable. Well, let me begin by saying, uh, you know, as I was mentioning before, uh, science fiction has been one of my great loves ever since I was a kid. In fact, you know, back in the 1950s, there were two things in the popular culture I was always really excited about. One was rock and roll music, and the other was science fiction. And one of the reasons why I became a writer uh, is because I've always had the view that if I really loved something as a consumer, I ought to try my hand at it. And I guess it's a good thing I didn't have a love for like nuclear physics or something like that. I probably would have blown the world up already. Uh, <laughs> but um, 
So I, I you know, I, I, I saw every science fiction film that I could. I, however, back then in the 50s and you know, early 60s, you know, the oldest science fiction uh, that I uh, would have seen would have been the famous Frankenstein. Now, actually, I'll, I'm going to mention in a few minutes, there was a, an earlier Frankenstein movie made in 1910, but that movie wasn't even known, you know, wasn't even available back then. But I would, you know, see movies on the uh, million dollar movie on Channel 9 in the New York area. You know, obviously this was, it was a very different world. There was no internet then. So it was really difficult to see older movies. But I managed to see the, the famous Frankenstein movie. I managed to see King Kong because that uh, was played on a million dollar movie. Like, I don't know, like every Thanksgiving or something like that. So uh, I developed a sense then of, even though in my love of science fiction, I loved and came to love Star Trek and then Star Wars and all those very well-known movies. And one of the reasons why I love them is I enjoyed seeing the futuristic gadgets that were in those movies. Seeing some older uh, science fiction movies, I realized I loved those too. Because even though the special effects were ridiculously simple or lacking in comparison to later movies, what wasn't lacking was that spirit of wonder and that sense that you could just tell the story being told had a real, you know, magic and beauty and excitement to it. And it, it spoke to the same part of at least my intellect as, as did the later movies. But I didn't do much about that until there came a point when, although I continued watching movies and you know continued uh, my love of movies and science fiction, I decided uh, to go back to school and get my master's degree and then uh, my PhD because uh, I figured uh, you know it could be a, a pretty good job becoming a professor. You know, as they say, it beats working for a living. So, I mean, even this past year, you know, as bad as COVID has been, and it's been horrible, it actually has made my life a lot easier because although I enjoy teaching in person, it, it's not as easy as just, you know, sitting up here in my office and talking to my students the way I talk to you. Uh, so, um, but back in the 70s, I realized that even without remote learning, that teaching could be a really good gig for someone like me who liked talking. As I was studying for my master's degree and then my PhD in communications and media, I, I naturally began as part of the curriculum looking at the history of movies and, and the history of filmmaking. And it wasn't before too long, no problem being late. I'm almost always uh, late, George. So um, I, before too long, I realized that right there at almost the very beginning of movies as a technology and a popular culture, there was a major, major science fiction movie. And it's probably something you've all heard of, but just to sort of set the context for that, usually, at least here in the United States, the first movie that's mentioned, in fact, it's the first movie that actually has a copyright to it, uh, was a movie called Fred Ott's Sneeze. And that's exactly what the movie was. This guy, he worked for Edison and he had like one of these like hearty sneezes and they thought it would be a great idea to make a movie of that. And the movie did very well. It was not shown in theaters. It was shown in these like, you know, little, well, they weren't so little. They were about, you know, three or four feet high. And you would put a penny and later a nickel in and you would, you know, turn the dial on the side and you would see the movie. Uh, and you know, the other thing about movies back then is that there were pioneers all over the place. So T Thomas Edison was the American pioneer. He did Fred Ott's Sneeze. 
I mentioned the early version of Frankenstein in 1910. That was Edison again. But um, after Edison started doing this, uh, in many ways, the vanguard of movie making moved to France. And there were, uh, there were two filmmakers, the Lumiere brothers. They did a little movie called The Train Enters the Station. But right around that time, there was a guy who was a magician, and I was immediately attracted to him. His name was Georges Méliès, M-E-L-I-E-S. And he made a movie which changed everything in movie making. Because up until mm -hmm. Georges Méliès, if, if you look at Edison's Fred Ott's first sneeze, if you look at the train enters the station, all that's happening is the filmmaker is, is setting up the camera and recording reality as it's happening. And in the case of Fred Ott Sneeze, I mean, it's a ridiculous reality. People were just so excited about the idea of capturing motion. There's no story there. At least with the train entering the station, there's a little bit of a story. A train you see far away that slowly enters the station. But Georges Méliès' movie, a Trip to the Moon, which came out in 1902. So, you know, it's not all that long ago, a little over a century ago. That movie told a story. And there are several important things about that movie because it set up all kinds of very, very important trains of development, which went into the 20th century and continue today. First of all, the movie was an adaptation, a very rough adaptation of uh, Jules Verne's famous novel, From uh, the Earth to the Moon, and H.G. Wells' novel, First Men on the Moon. So that was a major thing right there. I mean, th those are the two titans of science fiction. Jules Verne, of course, is older than H.G. Wells, a little better known at the time, but by, you know, 1900, 1901, 1902, H.G. Uh, Wells was getting pretty well known also. The other thing that happened uh, with uh, Georges Méliès is that he made his movie in a very, very different way. And there's actually a story that's associated with this. A few historians claim it's apocryphal. Uh, others say, no, it's true. There's an old Italian saying, uh, this may not be true, but it's a great story. And uh, I don't really care whether it's true or not. It's such a good story. The, the story is that Georges Méliès ha has a camera and he's out on the Champs-Élysées one afternoon. He's happily, you know, just filming everyone who's walking by in the tradition of the Lumiere brothers. And then calamity strikes. George Melier's camera jams. And, you know, he's very upset because he, he thinks it's going to ruin his movie. And after, you know, a few minutes, he knows what he's doing. He unclogs the jam. And George Melier does some more filming of people walking by. He's dejected. He brings, you know, the, the film home. He develops it. He knows it's going to be ruined. But something instead happens that changes the history of movie making and science fiction movie making in particular. Because rather than the movie being ruined, Georges Méliès, the magician, and you can appreciate this because he's a magician, he sees this amazing thing happen. He sees like an old woman walking by with a cane and boom, she just changes into a young woman walking by. Uh, he sees a little boy on a bicycle <laughs> that changes into some guy on a horse. What Georges Méliès had discovered is the technique of splicing, physically splicing photographic material. And it's sort of interesting that nowadays physical splicing no longer exists but it began, what we do today, in effect, began with what Georges Méliès was doing. Because he didn't really splice anything. His camera just stopped when it jammed. And when it started again, it picked up and one image flowed into the next. 
So again, whether that's a true story or not, Georges Méliès realized that here was an incredibly exciting, provocative, palpable, vivid way of telling a story. And he used this technique on his movie, A Trip to the Moon. By the way, uh, people back then were as much cutthroats and disrespecters of intellectual property as they are today. And it'll probably be, always be that way because Thomas Edison, who here in the United States was one of the great champions of you better respect my intellectual property, Edison's film company had no problem taking Georges Méliès' A Trip to the Moon and basically showing it here and earning money from it here without sending a cent back to Georges Méliès. So that's something else that began back then, the theft of intellectual property. In any case, A Trip to the Moon was a smash hit. It was successful everywhere it was shown. People loved it. And this showed another significant thing. As popular as the Jules Verne and H.G. Wells novels were, they were not as popular as Georges Méliès movie. People saw that movie who never read the books. And, you know, the same thing happens now. Uh, and just, you know, to just give one example, uh, probably all of you or most of you uh, who are listening to this have read the Foundation Trilogy and the Foundation books. Uh, and uh, you probably also know that Apple TV uh, is, is expecting, it was delayed because of COVID, to finally bring to the screen uh, a television series. This has been talked about for 50 years of the Foundation uh, series. Um, and I, if that is successful on Apple TV, what is going to happen is far, far many more people are going to be introduced to that brilliant series. And, you know, one that you go award for best all-time series, I think it still deserves it. Uh, but that's what motion pictures do, because it's far easier to watch something than it is to read something. It, it takes much less effort. And by the way, I'll just throw in here, I, I think both are wonderful. I, I don't think uh, watching something or listening something is antithetical to reading something. A different part of the brain is involved, but the human psyche, or if you want to get sort of metaphysical about it, the human soul is involved in, in all of those media. I, I, what I'll mention also about uh, Georges Méliès is that the, his movie was so successful that in 1904, just uh, two years later, he came out with another movie called The Impossible Voyage. And this time, the denouement of, the, of that movie was A Trip to the Sun. And uh, that movie wasn't as popular as A Trip to the Moon, but uh, you know that also had great success. By the way, how many of you saw there was a group, I'm not sure if it's still in existence, called Smashing Pumpkins? Mm -hmm. uh, right. And they had a video. Did you see that? And it has a clip from the original Georges Méliès uh, movie. And uh, I remember when I saw that in the Méliès movie, I was laughing. I was glad to see that Smashing Pumpkins put that in, in their video. It, the, the rocket goes to the moon and you see like a big face of the moon. And of course, mm -hmm. the rocket oh, lands in the moon's eye and it got out, you know. So Georges Méliès, the magician, had a sense of humor. You know, you're sending a ship to the moon. It's going to land on the moon. Uh, let's just hope it doesn't land in the man on the moon's um, eye. Um, before I go on and I talk about a, another uh, great old movie, if any of you have any thoughts or questions or comments about the Georges Méliès uh, movie and his contribution, uh, I'd be happy to hear them. Not about the movie, not the movie per se, but on the time frame, uh, we did have, uh, I can't think of the guy's name now. I remember his first name was Dennis, can't think of his 
Dennis Doros from Milestone Films as a speaker some years ago. And he showed, as part of his presentation, they, they have a DVD of the uh, Windsor McKay shorts, include uh, the Gertie the Dinosaur and so on. And so with that kind of stuff, that animation and where he, uh, where on the timeline does this fall? Does this happen around the same time or shortly after or shortly before or a lot long time afterwards? A long time after. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not the most knowledgeable film historian in the world, but, you know, I, I have looked into animation because animation is fascinating also. And by the way, there's a science fiction, you know, aspect, you know, to animation. If you think about what fairy tales are and what Disney did with fairy tales, at the very least, they're fantasy and, you know, maybe even their science fantasy sometimes or, or science fiction. But by and large, that wasn't done at all until a good 10 to 15 years after uh, Melies and a, uh, a Voyage to the Moon. But you're right to raise that point, because if you think about what animation is, animation is going one big step beyond Georges Melies rearranging of what is caught on camera, splicing together images. What animation obviously is, is you are drawing the images. They don't exist in reality at all. So um, there certainly were comic books, uh, you know, back then. Uh, and there were pretty, you know, early into the uh, 20th century, in effect, comic book characters in animated form, but they were not contemporary with Georges Méliès, as far as I know. Uh, Stephen? Hi, can you tell me how Méliès and the other pre-sound people dealt with characters? Because they can't speak. You know, how did they do characters and characterization? Well, you probably all know this. This was the silent movie era. And, mm -hmm. and actually, the term silent is not a good term. A better term would be speechless. Because some, sometimes and often, there was actually a musical score that was supposed to be played along mm -hmm. with the movie. And so in the better theaters, the movie would be shown by the time they started showing it on, on screens. And there would actually be an orchestra in the pit of the theater, which would be playing a score that sometimes the filmmaker made, other times they would hire someone. But the way they would uh, handle the issue of, of speech is putting words at the bottom of the screen. And you've probably all you know, mm -hmm. seen that. The, the movie that is uh, correctly credited with breaking out of that is a, is a 1927 movie starring Al Jolson called, you know, Mammy, my little old mommy. Uh, Al Jolson, uh, basically who uh, learned how to sing as a cantor, a, a Jewish guy, and, but he had a love of, of popular music as well. And um, by the late 1920s, there was an increasing, hey, isn't there any way we can get sound into the movie and hear people speaking. And uh, it, it seemed like a very good idea. And it was that, okay, a good way of getting sound in, we can still have when somebody is talking the written words, but maybe we can record someone singing. And that's really what is going on in the jazz thing. And you know, the typical thing that you get is the, the, the taste makers, the critics of the time, before the jazz singer came out was saying, nah, it's gonna be a flop. Who wants to see a guy sing, da ba da ba. And of course, quite to the contrary, the movie was such a big hit that there were just a handful of silent movies made after that. And so that's why to get back to what we're talking about, the Frankenstein movie that we know was one of the early movies with sound. And, um, so were the Dracula movies in the 1930s and a lot of other movies. Uh, but th there are feature length movies like Birth of a Nation, which by the way, are not science fiction, but they're not really 
true history as well, because this was made by D.W. Griffith around 1915. Uh, it's supposed to be a history of the United States, uh, but unfortunately it glorifies the Ku Klux Klan in that history. So filmmakers have always taken liberties with history, sometimes in a very unfortunate way. Um, all right, let's get to the first Frankenstein movie. Let me first tell you how I found out about the first Frankenstein movie. You can now see it anytime you want. It's on YouTube. Just do a search on the first Frankenstein movie and it'll come up for you. I, I, I first heard about this movie. You know, I'm a professor at Fordham University. So I would say about 15, you know, 17, 18 years ago. Um, Another professor came up to me, and this is relevant to where uh, at least some of you live uh, in New Jersey. Uh, and, and a professor came up to me uh, in my department and said, hey, did you hear about, th they uncovered this movie, an early version of Frankenstein, someplace in Southern New Jersey. And you know, it's not very clear, but it's pretty amazing. And uh, that's indeed, um, yeah, that's right. YouTube is is fabulous for these early films, uh, and and that's indeed uh, how this m movie had uh, was first discovered. By the way, I'll just make this point. I would say about a good thirty years ago, my wife and I were at some kind of auction uh, in upstate New York. And for a couple of bucks, we bought a couple of reels of old film. And I, to this day, I don't know what's on those reels. It's probably just home movies, you know, some family or whatever. And I never had a chance, you know, to bring it in and see if the thing is even salvageable. But someday I will. So if I, I just want to mention that here, because if some old great movie is discovered there, you, you're the first to, uh, to hear about it. Um, so, you know, Frankenstein, first of all, just like uh, obviously, you know, Jules Verne's and, and H.G. Wells' novels, Frankenstein as literature is a, an extraordinarily important work. In fact, one could argue even more important than even Verne and, and Wells, uh, simply because it was much earlier, much, much earlier. It, it was written, I, I don't know, like eight, it, there were a couple of early versions, 1817, 1818. That's a long time ago. And um, it was written by Mary Shelley. That's also important because obviously Mary Shelley was a woman. And I, it, it underlines the fact that uh, women uh, have, have had just as much uh, creative input throughout human history is men. It's just that because most of the popular culture controls are controlled by men, women have never gotten enough credit. And sometimes women authors have changed their name or have gone under pen names just to get around that problem. But not, not Mary Shelley. And um, she uh, wrote this novel and her husband was the great uh, poet, uh, Percy Shelley, and um, she was going to get attention just because of that, but people quickly discovered that this was a very, very profound novel. As a matter of fact, in, in many ways, just as profound or more profound even than going to the moon. I mean, going to the moon is an amazing thing, but it's it, it's something that it's ultimately an incredibly impressive mechanical accomplishment. But creating life from death is more than mechanical. And the idea, which is, of course, ridiculous as a real scientific possibility, but just the idea that you could somehow piece together dead bodies which aren't uh, you know, so decomposed that they don't have any form anymore uh, and, and give us some kind of electrical jolt 
uh, is a pretty amazing concept. And, it, and, it, and, and it's even more amazing when you think it happened at the beginning of the 1800s. That was a really, really long time ago. Uh, and so it's not surprising that Edison, who, you know, again, he was, as far as intellectual property was concerned, he wasn't the most honorable person in the world. What he was driven by, though, is he wanted to be first in everything. And, uh, you know, that, that was very deeply embedded in, into this enormous drive that got him to invent so many things, ranging from the phonograph, the pencil sharpener, I mean, you name it, Edison invented it, the electric light uh, and a, a motion picture process. And so it's not at all surprising that once the, the technology of motion pictures had improved, and it was just, you know, it was just really eight years after Melies. Uh, Edison makes this Frankenstein film. And, you know, here I have to say, you know, the question that Stephen raised, what they do about the sound? Um, one of the problems with the first Frankenstein movie is there's no sound. And we have all, we all now associate, you know, having seen the famous Frankenstein movie, you know, the noise, that the, the monster makes. And so obviously you don't get that in this first, you don't get, uh, 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 you, you don't get that in the uh, first Frankenstein film. Claire? Yeah, um, I wanted to ask, since you mentioned the electricity, I know uh, in the book, she doesn't say how the monster comes to life. There's no mention of dead bodies or electricity. I was wondering, were those elements actually introduced by Edison's version? Or I've, I've heard two theories. One is that Edison came up with it. And the other is that the 1930 Frankenstein was actually paying homage to Metropolis, which had come out three years earlier and featured an electrical transformation scene. Do you happen to know, I haven't seen the Edison version. Is the whole idea that dead bodies come to life when electrified from Edison or is it introduced later? Well, that's a very, very good question. And um, the, the, the facts uh, are not really completely known, or at least not completely known by me. There's no doubt, just to get to one part of your thing, that the, the famous Frankenstein movie was very, very aware of Metropolis, and, and it was something that seemed a very natural thing to do. But on the other hand, Edison, among his inventions, and uh, among the amazing things that he did, as I mentioned, were the electric light. And Edison was one of the great champions of electricity. He, he thought it was the wave of the future. There, there is, however, also uh, yet another huge controversy involving intellectual property in terms of Edison versus Tesla. There are many people who think that Tesla actually came up with a lot of this. Edison borrowed it, you know, to use the, the, the term. Sure, uh, but in, the, in the actual movie, In the actual movie, unfortunately, you can't really see in, in the 1910 movie. It, it's incredible. You, you can, again, look at it on YouTube. It's incredibly blurry. And okay. it's, it's nothing like, you know, what's, what, what is clear in the, in the 1930 movie. Right, okay. Uh, hey, hey, Claire. Excuse me, I'm sorry. And Claire, if my memory serves me, around the turn of the 1800s, there was a scientist called Volta, I believe his name is, and I believe he did experiments with animating frogs' legs. I think you're thinking of Galvin, right. uh, as in galvanize. Right, but, but I'm sure Volta, Volts and Volta did things like that, and... Uh, I'm wondering if that has something to do with uh, where Mary Shelley got the idea that electricity could or could uh, create dead bodies right. from things. Because it's all about the same time. It's all around. Right. So we know from Mary Shelley's writings that she was familiar with those experiments with electricity and frog's legs. But when she wrote Frankenstein, she specifically did not specify anything about the process because the conceit is that Dr. Frankenstein is writing this down and he doesn't want anyone to try what he tried. 
So she right. specifically declines to say anything is electricity, chemically, mechanically, right? So the the classic elements we have, you know, they are heavily based on the movies that have been made uh, since. You know, the, the transformation scene is really not even in the book. In the book, he he comes into the story saying like, okay, so to make a long story short, I found a way to make an inanimate thing alive. Okay. And then as soon as I did, I regretted it. And like, then the story goes from there. Okay. Yo, let me just add that uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne in his book, House of the Seven Gables, that's I think like 1848. He talks about how electricity going around the world is basically turning the planet Earth into one big pulsating brain. And he got that idea because of the telegraph, which, uh, you know, Morse gets most of the credit for, but other people were working on it. And that was being developed as early as the 1920s. So there's no doubt uh, whether Mary Shelley intended that or not, that when she wrote Frankenstein, people were very focused on electricity and what it could do. Uh, you know, I, you can go a little bit further back. It, Benjamin Franklin, who's flying the kite a good 30 years before Frankenstein, and he's showing how, you know, electricity can be conducted and what a powerful force it is. And, and Franklin was a scientist as well as a politician. So... I don't think it's an unreasonable uh, assumption that uh, that Mary Shelley may have been talking, thinking about that, even though the conceit she used, as Claire said, was was not that. And therefore, that I would assume that that's what Edison uh, was, you know, had in mind, uh, because again, Edison's middle name was electricity, and uh, you know there. One other point I'll just make here, and this is yet another fascinating thing about history, in the very early days of automobiles, there were battles between Henry Ford, who was building cars that worked on gasoline, and people who were building electric cars, and that was back in the 1890s and the very early 19 aughts and a little afterwards, and eventually it was Rockefeller, not Nelson Rockefeller, but his grandfather, who basically became a millionaire selling oil that wound up putting all the electrical car companies out of business. But, but there was a while when it looked like the two things were sort of in competition uh, with each other. Um, in any case, um, let's you know, move on to, uh, we, we started with France, we went back to the United States for the first Frankenstein film, in 1910. Um, in, in 1920, and I saw somebody mentioned uh, the, the golem or dare golem in chat, uh, the chat, there, there were two movies made and both of them were made in Germany. And um, here, let me just make a point which I always feel necessary to make about German filmmaking. Back in the 1920s, the two greatest places in which films were being made were in Germany and in the Soviet Union. And in the Soviet Union, Lev Kuleshov, you know, took splicing to new heights, uh, you know, d doing his montages, discovering that you just put two very different images together and it says something. He did a famous experiment where th there was like a man with like an intense, you know, the kinds of looks they captured on camera back then, an intense look in his eye. And then they spliced that, uh, followed that with a bowl of soup and they asked people, what is this guy feeling what's going on here and the, the people said well he's obviously intensely hungry he hasn't eaten in a week he's starving and that, then they had a you know shot of, of the same exact shot of the Russian actor with uh, a little baby and people said oh my god what, what a wonderful father look at the love he has for this child then they really went crazy and they uh, Kuleshov and his uh, assistants had that same shot with a woman decked out dead in a coffin and th then people spun the story oh he's lost the love of his life he's just going to jump into the coffin you know right there with her so i mean th they did great stuff there 
but unfortunately for the world, uh, Kuleshov shortly after began doing things that were just Soviet propaganda even though today he is still rightly considered one of the great filmmakers. Meanwhile, in Germany, and I'll get back to the two great science fiction movies, um, actually three great science fiction movies, but the two that you know came out in the 1920s, Germany, as we know, uh, by the 1930s, Hitler and the Nazis were in power. And there you have the fascinating story of Leni Riefenstahl, who is justly regarded as one of the greatest filmmakers of the 20th century. But a lot of people don't like saying that because the great films that she made glorified Hitler in the Third Reich, Triumph of the Will and the Olympiad. <clears throat> but I mention this because it is interesting that although film was invented and even developed to a certain extent in France and the United States and England, it, within a decade or two, the, the cutting edge moved to Germany and, and the Soviet Union. So in, in 1920, let's talk about the goal and first. I'm not sure which movie was made first. They both have 1920 uh, credit. I mean, the, the, the Golem is a good thing to talk about right after Frankenstein, because it's been correctly said that, th that one of the things Mary Shelley must have been aware of is the Golem which is uh, a, 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 a Jewish legend uh, about a rabbi who puts together from clay uh, something that looks like a person and the clay is somehow imbued with a spirit and, and uh, that spirit is the golem. And with that, which by the way, precedes, and I should mention this, precedes Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, let alone all the Frankenstein movies. This myth goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, probably back to the early Middle Ages. And uh, it, it, it has some very recognizable characteristics in all these stories about making life out of non-life or former life. And, and that's that the, the creature, the, the product, uh, unfortunately, in these stories, is always on the verge of repaying his or her creator with death, you know, and uh, and and things that are not good. And uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. That you, people have said, "Well, wh why did the golem come up in the first place as such an important myth?" And you know, most uh, historians think, and I think correctly so, that. Uh, the, what what it was trying to say, the golem in in religious tradition is, don't be too arrogant. You know, you may think you're smart, but don't try to be God. Only God can create life. If if you try to create life, you may get some benefits from it, but it's going to turn around and not do anything to help you, and in fact, you know, badly hurt you. And so. This is something which we see in, uh, you know, Frankenstein to some extent, but it's seen much more sharply in the Golem. By the way, there was a movie made in Israel, I think just two or three years ago. If I had to take yesterday, like 2018, called the Golem. So this is still, you know, a, uh, a, a very hot topic uh, for the obvious reasons. It's still very uh, interesting. And, um, and by the way, to get back again to the question of silent versus talky, all the movies we're talking about here are silent because, again, these are all before Al Jolson's uh, movie, um, which sort of broke the ice and, be, and got speech into it. So The Golem, you know, was a successful movie, but... Um, I, I'm mentioning it after Frankenstein because the two, Frankenstein and the Golem, really are part of a larger underlying similar theme. But the other 1920 movie, also made in Germany, which you've all no doubt heard of, and it's a great movie, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And uh, boy, he was an ugly uh, dude, this uh, Dr. Caligari. And uh, this is considered to be 
not only a masterpiece in science fiction uh, movie making, but it's considered to be a pinnacle in German expressionism, which is what the German approach to movie making was. So after, you know, again, in terms of the history of motion pictures, you know, after we get through, you know, Melies, Edison, all these people, by the time we get to the early 1920s, you, you see that there are at least two schools of thought being developed. Uh, montage, uh, which as I mentioned is Sergei Eisenstein and the young Soviet Union, and Expressionism, which the German filmmakers love. And without getting into too much detail about that, one of the differences between Expressionism and Montage, as I mentioned before, Montage, the essence of Montage is you tell a story by putting two images together that have no connection in reality, and then the viewer weaves a story from them. Expressionism, you try to respect the way we see things in reality. So, and you can see the two things, by the way, in movies today. If you're watching a movie and you see something like slowly panning, or just to give a very well-known example, take the beginning of Psycho, you know, the Hitchcock movie where it begins with a camera looking in a window and going through the window and going into the window. That kind of continuous flow, that's what is meant by expressionism. It's saying, try to tell a story without breaking the visual frame. It's not that there, there are cuts in expressionism, but they try to go for the, the most extended kind of visual frame possible, because that to some extent is the way we see things. Of course, someone who believes in montage would say, well, hey, what happens if we close our eyes for a second or turn our head? The reality then is split up and our minds piece it together. So both uh, schools uh, have a uh, logic uh, to it. Um, Excuse me, Paul. Sure, go. Uh, we wa I watched for the first time last night The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And one thing that strikes me at upon watching it is the movie that I draw a, a parallel with is the movie The Sixth Sense because you think you're in one story all the way up until the very end and then you get there's actually something very different going on but all of the clues were put there in advance and you, 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 the, the filmmaker is being very honest with you in a certain way, but at a, on a certain level, they're being very cagey with you. Thank you. No, I think that's a great example. And you know what uh, the cabinet of Caligari, Dr. Caligari is dealing with is in, in an insanity, an insane hypnotist and, and, and a somnambulist, someone who basically walks in their sleep, doesn't know what they're doing. And in a way, if you think about the sixth sense, that's a very good, uh, you know, analogy, Phil, because it, it's. Let's face it, uh, you can interpret the sixth sense in one or two ways. Uh, you know, the the science fictional way is that this person is really seeing dead people and they're really there talking to him. You, but you can just basically say this person is insane. He has very powerful illusions. And, and in that sense, the two movies are similar. Um, by the way, uh, you know, the um, movie, uh, you know, movie making in general and movies like The Sixth Sense, um, I once met M. Night Shyamalan. In fact, uh, you mentioned before that in my uh, vast career and all the various kinds of damage I've done, I, uh, I was president of Science Fiction Writers of America. And um, one of the things I did when I was president, believe it or not, just to give you a little history of the Science Fiction Writers of America, now the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, in case you're interested, or even if you're not interested, I think this is interesting. Um, there was a time when uh, the Science Fiction Writers of America was not giving out Nebula awards to anything having to do with movies because it was reasoned that there were too many people involved in making a movie. So 
who who gets the nebula? The director, the screenwriter, the actor. You know, whereas if you, if you're talking about giving a nebula for the best short story or the best novelette or the best novella or the best novel, there's only one person. I mean, maybe the editor has some input, but basically it's one person's work. Whereas film is inherently a group process like that. I mean, you have people like Charlie Chaplin who do everything, but for the most part, there are there's more than one creative mind involved in, in a movie, and. Um, one of the things that uh, I did and my predecessor, Robert J. Sawyer, who was president of uh, several before me, and Rob and I talked about it because I was his vice president. And uh, one of the things that Rob wanted to do is reinstate the nebula for the best dramatic film presentation. And I agreed with him completely. And in my view, a lot of retrograde forces, and hey, I'm glad this is being recorded. I hope some of those retrograde forces see this. But in my view, these retrograde forces were very much against that. They thought it was violating some fundamental principle. But Rob had a referendum and the majority of uh, science fiction writers in the organization agreed. So all this is to say, I had the pleasure with presenting uh, M. Night Shyamalan with a Nebula Award for his movie making. And um, in fact, uh, I, I, I won't go get it for you now, but I'll send uh, Phil after this and he can share it with you a picture of me, much younger, but with a big smile on my face, actually giving the award to, uh, to Shyamalan in Philadelphia when he was on the set making another movie, Unbreakable, with uh, Samuel Jackson. So that was a lot of fun. But the reason why I mention all this is that there's no doubt that M. Night Shyamalan is, is not only a, a master filmmaker, but a scholar of film history. So, you know, it wouldn't surprise me at all that he had a great movie on his mind when he, when he was doing some of his great movies. Um, I just want to say something, though, else about, because uh, again, I hadn't thought about this before, but the question again about sound and, and these old movies, you know, if you think about it, one of the bedrocks of post-1930 horror movies is the scream, right? I mean, the blood-curdling scream. I mean, there, there are screams in other kinds of movies as well. There are screams like in, you know, it's just like a police drama, you know, hearing some horrible scream and they come in the house and somebody's being murdered or whatever. But but the essence of the blood curdling scream always was somebody sees a monster and goes, ah! And, you know, you, you couldn't do that in silent movies, but you got to give the silent movie maker credit for uh, nonetheless presenting a blood curdling frightening story. And... Uh, <laughs> Can I say one thing about the oh. uh, a moment of unintentional humor in, you know, in silent movies, if someone needed to say something important, of course, that had to be an intertitle. Uh, but what I realized recently is that means that you can read the, the line in any tone you want. So I actually watched uh, the 1925 The Lost World and towards the end there's an intertitle that says in huge letters, my brontosaurus has escaped, please stay off the streets until it's recaptured. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom went to acting school so she loves this game where like okay so now say that like you're bored oh my brontosaurus has escaped please stay off the streets or say that like you're angry my brontosaurus escaped if <laughs> we were kind of going around like how many different tones could you possibly have when announcing that your brontosaurus escaped <laughs> no i i love that and, and of course the other thing is by our standards and i assume by most people's standards it's a somewhat ridiculous statement anyway what kind of idiotic statement by i mean in in universe that's exactly what has just happened the brontosaurus yeah. escaped i know I mean, you had to more that stay off the street not to mention the fact that it seems to me any halfway decent brontosaurus whether you were on the street or not it could smack its head right through your window but fortunately i mean so i guess a rejoinder could have been a brontosaurus is a vegetarian. Don't worry. Maybe he'll eat your snake plant, or, right. but, but you're okay. Yeah. I was reading about it, though, and at the time, they, they weren't really sure with, like, paleontology was still pretty young, so they weren't really sure which animals were, were um, you know, herbivores or not. But, 
you'll notice in the movie, the Brontosaurus doesn't attack anybody. It's just panicking because it's in, you know, a loud, crazy London after living its whole life in an isolated jungle. It starts like snapping at the bridges and the cars and stuff. It's not actually trying to eat anybody. It's just scared, you yeah. know, as if you brought your dog to the middle of Times Square on New Year's Eve and the dog panicked, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's really the same story with King Kong, right? Kong isn't trying to hurt anybody. Uh, yeah, know. once I saw The Lost World, I was like, oh, King Kong literally stole the whole like breakout sequence uh, from The Lost World and the Brontosaurus. Yeah, that's right. That's a great story, though. That is one of the funniest lines. I, I mean, the, you know, this is, what was the name of that uh, series, which I think they brought back, you know, like these two, two people, like an alien and a person sitting in the front row of a movie theater and something. Mystery that's Science what, Theater 3000. That's right. So so you can imagine the, the two of them talking and laughing about the, uh, you know, that Brontosaurus line. That's a, that's a great line. Um, Let's talk about another movie. And this movie, you know, I don't know exactly when the jazz single was made. It's, it's possible that, that this movie was made literally as the jazz single was being made, even though the jazz singer um, may have come out a little later. And the movie I'm talking about, and this is, I think, a truly great uh, movie. I mean, all the movies I've mentioned are great, but this is Metropolis, the 1927 movie by Fritz Lang. And uh, this movie has like a bunch of distinctions. Again, it's, it's not the first talkie, it is a silent movie, but it's the first feature length uh, film in, in the science fiction uh, genre. And uh, that is, uh, there were feature length movies made uh, prior to then, but not uh, in, in science fiction and uh, or, or horror, and that's interesting right there. But Metropolis w was the first, and it also uh, took a long time to make. I mean, this is like the beginning of what we're now very accustomed to in science fiction movie making. That is, the, the movie is long, the movie takes a very long time to make in addition to being long, and that's because it has so many special effects. And um, the, the person who made that movie, of course, is Fritz. Lang. And um, as I was thinking about talking about this movie to you today, I, I just, uh, I guess I, you know, about two weeks ago, saw a Tenet, uh, the, the Christopher Nolan movie. Now you might ask, why, why did I uh, only see it two weeks ago? Uh, what happened with that movie, just briefly, as you probably know, uh, Nolan wanted to bring it out but unfortunately the pandemic had just set in. He postponed its release like two times, finally couldn't take it anymore. So it came out last September. And then a few months after that, it was on various pay-per-view outlets. That's my phone ringing, that's Phil DePardo's phone. Probably getting a call from somebody saying, get that lunatic off the screen, okay? In any case, um, but uh, I'm an incredible cheapskate. If I can see something for nothing, uh, I'll, I'll do it. So I, I was waiting until I could see it on HBO. But anyway, there is something about the way Christopher Nolan makes his movies that I think he's indebted to Fritz Lang. The, the amount of attention, the extraordinary... Uh, That's my aim, partner. <laughs> okay. The extraordinary attention to detail. Uh, and we see that uh, with Fritz Lang. We saw it in earlier movie making, and again, to get back to D.W. Griffith, Birth of a Nation, that movie has extraordinary detail also. And, and that's you know, a very sophisticated movie. That movie, there was a score that was played again in the pit of the theater when the movie was shown. So D.W. Griffith got it. Uh, unfortunately, he used his talents, I think, in a, uh, in a racist way. But um, Fritz Lang got it also. And he, he is one of the people, he, he's really a titan in the silent era for, for taking that amount of time to make a movie. And uh, I don't know if he has any uh, descendants who are still alive. I mean, probably, I don't, I don't know really anything about his personal life, but, but they should take satisfaction in knowing that, that he, here we are 
uh, in uh, 2021. And, uh, you know, it's a little uh, less than 100 years, but we're pretty close to 100 years from when that movie came out. And that movie is still being talked about. It's studied um, in film classes. And uh, the, the other thing about Fritz Lang is in terms of I was saying about montage versus expressionism, Fritz Lang also, like Alfred Hitchcock, wasn't uh, at all uh, concerned about or worrying about- Oh, believe me, if this doesn't get fixed. About mixing montage with expressionism. And I think that's the hallmark of a great movie maker as well. By the way, someone who loved Metropolis, who made a couple of silent movies himself, and then went on to uh, basically make an extraordinary number of uh, movies that were talkies. And maybe I'm overlooking it, but I would say this filmmaker made at least one science fiction movie. And I'm talking about Alfred Hitchcock. And uh, who knows what science fiction movie I'm talking about that Alfred Hitchcock made. The birds. That's right, the birds, which really is science fiction. I mean, you know, bird, so, you know, if you look sometimes at crows and birds, uh, you know, it might look like they're going to attack you, but they never do. And uh, they never do what they did to poor Tippy Hedren. I can't remember the name of her character, but she, uh, she played um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the hero in, in that movie. But Alfred Hitchcock was a great believer in doing uh, whatever uh, was needed to get the idea across. He, he made a point of saying, I'm not wedded to any filmic style. You, you know, I'll use montage if I think that is what's needed. I'll use mise-en-scene if I think that would work better. And, and that's what you see in Metropolis. And that's why it's such a masterpiece. Let me just look at the chat because I don't want this to end without my just being totally unresponsive. I want to make sure. Yeah, okay. I'm just I'm just reading from the bottom up because I do everything backwards. Uh, thanks. I see the birds is written here. James um, mentioned that, and yes, Lang's Fury, Ministry of Fear is also a great movie. They are both great movies. Yeah, the uh, the but the Battleship Potemkin. Uh, is not uh, a German movie. That is a montage movie um, with um, uh, Russian, made, right? Uh, made in the in the new Soviet Union. Um, by the way, another name for what I was saying about um, expressionism in Germany. In case you're interested, you may have heard of this: is mise en scène, and and that's French for literally in the scene, stay in the scene, put, put it in the scene, be in the scene. And, it, and it's, in a way, it's sort of movies equivalent of, of being present, you know, be there. And, and the, the, the people who, you know, were uh, geniuses at mise-en-scene and expressionism, th they thought that the problem with montage is that it took people out of the scene because what it was doing was just cutting from one thing to another. Uh, Stephen. Can you tell me what film uh, had the first professional actors in it? You know, the first stars, you know. Well, that, well first of all, if you're talking about the first science fiction uh, movie, oh, any, a, any movie? Yeah. yeah. I've actually heard um, Thomas Edison um, hired a, a local theatrical actress to be in one of the early ones that was just like seven seconds long. So like, technically there was an actress in a seven second movie now lost to us in like 1894 or something. Okay. But I, I'll give you some background about that, which I always found interesting. And, you know, we, we see it today in a different way and I'll explain what I mean. When motion pictures, when Edison and, you know, Melies and those people first started doing motion pictures, theatrical actors and actresses didn't want to get anywhere close to them. They thought it was a debasement of their craft. 
they thought it cheapened them to be in a motion picture because to them, the essence of acting is you stand on a stage, you move on a stage, you speak, you emote on a stage, and you see human beings and you see their faces. And, and it bothered them deeply that, you know, it, the only faces they saw was of the technician uh, or maybe a director shouting orders. Uh, and so in, in many uh, cases, we don't even know who these people were because they deliberately didn't give their names or they didn't give their real names. And it's sort of interesting if you look at the evolution of, of this medium, the same exact thing happened again when television came along in the 1950s and 1960s. That even, that remained until fairly recently. Uh, it, probably until The Sopranos, you know, on HBO, late uh, 1990s, early uh, 21st century. Up until then, you know, if you were a great actor, um, look, Lawrence Olivier was alive when there was television. Lawrence Olivier, you'll never see him guest starring or doing a lead in any television series. He, he just thought, uh, and uh, who played, uh, I just can't think of a name, in Gone with the Wind. Um, what's her name? She, I, she's, I, she's either still alive or died just in the past year. You mean <laughs> Olivia de Havilland? Yes. Oh, she's still alive, Olivia de Havilland? No, she died uh, last June. Yeah. Oh, what a great actress she was. But if I'm not mistaken, I mean, I could be wrong. I don't think Olivia de Havilland was ever in any television show. She lived a long time. She, she had some movie roles, you know, certainly in the 70s and even early 80s, and maybe even beyond that. But, you know, to her, it was almost a debasement to appear on television. And you know what the odd thing is now? There are actors and actresses, I've heard them say this, they wouldn't be in a, in a web series, you know, mm -hmm. because that to them. And th this is something which when you study popular culture, it's always the newest thing that is regarded as somehow unworthy and, and not as good as the previous thing. So, you know, you, you, you have this written literature when it's made into film, somehow the film's a debasement of it. And then television is the basement of movies, and and now you know web uh, audio visual is a debasement of of um, of, of more uh, traditional streaming and television itself. I mean, I, I go ahead. I think for a second, two things. One is I think it was when uh, there were a couple of very famous guest stars on Friends, Bruce Willis, and um, uh, I can't remember who the other one was that you saw somebody who was a megastar crossing the line as a favorite or a friend. The other thing was, it's not just a question of art, frankly, but a question of, of uh, moolah. And if you, there was a belief for a long time that if you debased yourself or if you did a television show, it signaled that you were no longer a movie star and it would affect your ability to get those kinds of roles. Yeah. And that was true for a long time. No, that's very true. Um, I can't remember, I, I'm forgetting the title of everything I, wanted to mention. What was the thing that Bruce Willis uh, first began? Moonlighting. Moonlighting, right. And who played his opposite? Sybil Shepherd. Good, thank you. So Sybil yeah. Shepherd, didn't she, she appeared first in the last picture show and, uh, and, and, and she was, you know, a just, justly lauded star of that show. But she uh, always was, you know, a creative progressive thinker and she saw the value in, in going into moonlighting. And in fact, that did uh, you know, help her career and add to her career. Um, what, by the way, let me just mention something else here, which I think is relevant uh, to this as well. Uh, if you think about the Twilight Zone, which, which again is television, and um, obviously it's, it's way, it's well beyond, it's, it's uh, you know, 27, 28 years after the Frankenstein sound movie that, that's like the end of the era we're talking about. But I think it's important to mention that Rod Serling had a, a very similar sense of the plasticity of how you could tell a science fictional story in a new medium that the people who are making silent movies from science fiction had. And, and uh, you know, that's often missed. I mean, he, he first of all, he, he loved, he, he, you know, some of the things were original stories written just for television, but he loved 
taking, well, for example, the Damon Knight story to serve man and, and making a, a, a brilliant you know, television adaptation of that. And, and so what you see there uh, with Rod Serling, I think, is in the television medium, a, a sort of uh, renaissance of some of what we've been talking about. Because television in the 1950s was the way motion pictures were in the 19 aughts and the 19 teens and even the 1920s. And, uh, and, and Serling really uh, captured that. Um, and, it's hard, and it's a very difficult thing to recapture. I don't know if any of you saw any of the, uh, getting back to Apple TV, which as I mentioned, is gonna be showing a, uh, you know, a, 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 a series of the foundation story. But one of the first things they put on last year, last spring, is a, a sort of Twilight Zone-like series uh, that, um, you know, Steven uh, Spielberg was behind it. And, um, you know, it was a weekly anthology series, but um, it, Amazing Stories was its name, obviously mm -hmm. taken from the magazine, which I've had a couple of stories published in, but it didn't do very well. And I think the reason that didn't do very well was trying to do what uh, Serling was, had done with the Twilight Zone and even the Outer Limits later had done, but it, it, it just couldn't do it because it's a, it, it was back then a different time than it is now. By the way, let me just throw in something else since I keep talking about Apple TV. I would highly recommend uh, for all mankind there are two seasons of it on Apple TV if you can get to see it. Ronald D. Moore is the creative force behind it. So you know what he did, uh, you know, with uh, the, 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 the reboot of Battlestar Galactica and obviously Outlander. But this is basically an alternate history of the, the uh, human species getting to the moon. And when I, when I was talking about Georges Méliès' trip to the moon, I, I was thinking that in a way, the, the current representative of that is for all mankind. And not to give anything away because it, it, it's there in the description, the, the, the setup of the story is that everything is the same through 1969 until the Soviets surprise the United States and get human beings to the moon a month earlier than our Apollo mission. And that changes everything. The, the, the Russians are there and we're there and uh, you know everything changes in minor ways and major ways. So if you're interested in voyages to the moon uh, and, and you, know, you like uh, a trip to the moon uh, I, you know, and, and you've read uh, Highline, The Moon is a Hot Mistress and all those various moon stories, uh, I, I would recommend for all mankind. Paul, I'd like to interrupt you here for a moment for a couple of things. First of all, we normally stop at around an hour and a half. Now, we're not giving you a hard deadline, but I don't know what you're going. Uh, and there's a whole batch of films that we haven't yet talked about. So if you would like, and you do not need to make an instant answer on this, but if you want to do a Films Before Frankenstein Part 2 at a later date, we can certainly do that because we have not even touched upon a number of films that I had expected us to be talking about at this point. Uh, secondly, it's very easy to say, you know, we mentioned this film, this is a great film, this is a great film, this is a great film. But I think that in, in so many ways, Metropolis was such a pivotal and groundbreaking, and not just from a historical point of view, but also it has, a, I, I believe, even a continuing ep, uh, influence in the way that many of these films we've talked about in the past do not, where you have <laughs> Madonna doing, uh, you know, very clearly in an MTV video from the 1980s or 90s uh, is, is very clearly Metropolis or, uh, uh, inspired. Uh, also, another part of the, th the whole Metropolis mythos is that they keep finding little bits and pieces of the movie so that we now see, uh, I think it's the Kino video, has a much 
many more scenes than had existed before that. In fact, there are rumors that Zack Snyder is working on a seven and a half hour restoration of the Zack Snyder Metropolis cut. <laughs> yeah, I, I tried to look up Metropolis to watch it recently, and I got runtime estimates that were ever from like 90 minutes to two and a half hours to like two hours, like every cut is a different length by a lot. Yeah, though no, that that is fascinating. You could we could do a whole uh, hour and a half just on that for sure. I can give you an answer now. Let, let's. Uh, I'll be happy to come back and do this. You know, part two at a later uh, date, since since we don't have that much more time. Um, actually, I'm glad I was able to do this uh, even tonight because uh, where right now I'm in the situation of I'm just finishing up the three classes that, as I mentioned, I've been teaching online, I'm grading, you know, final projects, which actually I'm one of the rare professors who enjoys doing that, reading and watching and grading projects. But next week, we're going to be going up to Cape Cod. So we're, we're packing to do that. So ordinarily, I would say let's go until uh, 11 o'clock tonight. But it, but it would suit me better to, to wait for some future date, if, if you, if you uh, want to go that way. And not have another more eloquent scholar talk to you about those other movies. Hey, Paul, Paul, yes. I just wanted to add something personal, uh, if you don't mind. I'm a huge science fiction fan, going back to 1971 and uh, a story by Werner Vinge. Thank you for all you've done for the, uh, for the, uh, for the, uh, for the, uh, for science fiction and science fiction in general. And thank you for realizing that it's not just science fiction, you know. Thank you. Well, listen, thank you, Paul. <laughs> well, listen, thanks very much for that. That means a lot to me and it's truly been my pleasure. And, you know, I'm not sure why uh, on that particular subject, how in effect science fiction got off on the wrong foot. You, you know, they used to say in the 1950s and 60s, people who appreciate science fiction is that it's not all bug-eyed monsters. Um, and uh, I, I've never understood why, for example, the New York Times for years and years and years, and I really shouldn't complain because Gerald Jonas, who for many years reviewed science fiction in the New York Times, he gave the Silk Code a very good review. Um, but these reviews always appeared like on page 32 or 38, like three or four reviews with like two or three paragraphs each, if you were lucky, squashed together. Uh, in contrast to, you know, a novel about a dysfunctional Southern family having no <laughs> uplifting values, just about human misery, that basically gets front page, you know, cover and, and, a, and a huge review. And, um, so th that's what Miss Dason, my librarian in junior high school, and the New York Times, you know, both had in common. And, uh, you know, I was a little kid then, I was 12 years old. I didn't understand it then. And uh, I've never understood that. And I don't understand it now. Because as our discussion has shown, it's not as if somehow science fiction originally was just bug-eyed monsters, no depth, no thought, and then mm -hmm. suddenly it grew up in the 1970s or 80s. Uh, no, it, from the very beginning, it was a very rich and it's continued to be it. And that's the reason why people like us have become excited by it. Because, you know, look, there's nothing more exciting than thinking about and playing out what the human species can do. And, uh, it, it, for that reason, I would say that contrary to many literary theorists, I, not only is science fiction not inferior to other kinds of fiction, science fiction is superior to most other kinds of fiction because it focuses on what quintessentially makes us human, which is not just to keep living the way we're living, but to imagine a better world a world where human beings can do more, can accomplish more, can, can, can discover things about how the earth arose, how life arose, can have an idea of what's going on in this universe beyond this planet. 
uh, that's what science fiction uh, is all about. And you know, once you realize that, how can you not help but love it and just want to talk about it all the time? Hey, Paul, if all fiction are problem stories, we have bigger problems. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Look, the other thing is maybe uh, if, if there had been more science fiction, there, there was a, 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 there have been a fair number of science fiction stories and novels and movies about plagues, but they also weren't taken that seriously. You know, mm -hmm. viewed as escapist. Um, you know, it would be an interesting thing to look into. You often hear that, for example, Marvin Minsky, the late MIT uh, artificial intelligence professor and expert was inspired uh, by Isaac Asimov's robot stories, just mm -hmm. as you, uh, you know, I've read, you may know that Paul Krugman, the uh, Nobel laureate economist was inspired by Harry Seldon in, in the foundation theories. It would be interesting. Uh, and I bet that there are some great um, epidemiologists out there who have been inspired by some of those science fiction stories as well. May I add a personal note? Sure. Uh, uh, what I like about science fiction the most is that it concentrate is that it concentrates on how and not why. And uh, you know, as somebody who is sort of in the sciences, the how is more important than the why, and that's why I like science fiction. Yeah, that's a, that's great. That's great. All right, well, Julia's saying she's going. I, it's 856, so now it's probably uh, thanks for the applause, Julia. Listen, I really enjoyed this. It was a great discussion, and it got me thinking about a lot of things. I want to thank Phil for inviting me. Thank you, Phil. And um, thank all of you. And um, I'll come back here sometime in the future. If I had a time machine, maybe I'd just step into it and Thank you, Paul. We very much enjoyed it. I know you have a very busy schedule. We loved having you down the past and we look forward to having you down in the future. Uh, good night, everyone. And we hope to see you at our, everyone at our other events too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Take Bye. care. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.